Hi there. So Vitalik and I want to present an article that we published last May entitled Blockchain Code as Antitrust. In a nutshell, that paper integrates legal and technological approaches and shows specifically that blockchain and antitrust can benefit from one another as they seek the same objective, which Vitalik will tell you about in a few seconds. It follows that when the law cannot fully apply, blockchain can help and vice versa. In short, we are arguing for cooperation between the law and the technology, rejecting the confrontational approach our societies have been taking. But of course, that cooperation implies mutual concessions because antitrust and blockchain are made of different materials. That's the idea. Now, you may ask, what's the common goal? So the idea is um, that you know, we're talking about decentralization um, and decentralization and particularly economic decentralization is something that has a long history of uh, being understood to be something that's really kind of inherently valuable for an economy or a society in a lot of ways. Right? So Indeed, uh, both antitrust and blockchain seek decentralization. Too often, however, we hear a common misconception that both would seek a certain outcome, namely a fragmented market, but they're not. Uh, it's in fact all about the process. The capture of economic power must remain possible for all the market players, making sure that no entity can live the quiet life. Uh, that's, that's the idea. Uh, that's the idea to decentralize monopolistic confidence. That applies to antitrust and also to blockchain. Now, if we look at blockchains, well, the idea behind blockchains is also decentralization, right? So blockchains kind of come from these cypherpunk and open source movements, and they're all about disrupting centralized platforms, reducing barriers to entry, providing users with trustful features that uh, remove the need to have central authorities that provide those same forms of trust. And, but blockchain communities also sometimes have centralization when that centralization actually results in uh, uh, providing very valuable services, right? You have uh, a, a lot of these uh, centralized actors um, like uh, just companies that are building projects and you might have exchanges, you might have people running uh, layer two transaction systems of different kinds and of companies providing wallets and you have this entire kind of spectrum and Sometimes this is fine, right? And sometimes, you know, you have centralized actors that actually do kind of succeed because, well, they deserve to succeed and they provide good services. But um, at the same time, you know, there is this uh, kind of pressure to really try hard to reduce the, the extent to which this happens kind of outside of those situations where it really is a good idea for it to happen, right? At the protocol layer, um, no, no, we really try hard to kind of push for more decentralization at the application layer and so forth. So in neither case is it a question of kind of pushing for decentralization at all costs. It's definitely a question of pushing for decentralization at medium costs because decentralization has big benefits. It lets us uh, uh, not just have uh, more efficiency, but also uh, of less risk um, in terms of uh, creating these centralized actors that could potentially end up being very harmful. And it basically uh, kind of preserves freedom in some sense, right? It basically means that people have, are more likely to have a meaningful ability to move from one provider to another provider. So um, decentralization is the common goal. Uh, but it is not decentralization at, at all costs indeed. Uh, it's about decentralization that creates efficiency, which is kind of new. Outside of blockchain, we, we often see that efficiency gains are where you find centralization. That's Ronald Coe's paper on the nature of the firm. But uh, things are different with blockchain, which uh, kind of reconciles the two. Again, uh, efficiency and decentralization. So uh, naturally, you may ask how to achieve that goal of decentralization. Well, um, antitrust is the rule of law, and that rule applies ex post when it comes to anti-competitive practices, which are collusion and monopolization, which means that antitrust applies to stop and correct these practices. And it also applies ex ante when it comes to merger control uh, by opposing concentrations and, and having a closer look. But that's in theory. In practice, Antitrust does not always apply or not fully. Uh, for instance, we see in some international cases, jurisdictions may be mutually unfriendly and refuse to enforce the law of the other, 
uh, we also see on top of that that uh, technology may create barriers to enforcement actions. And in any case, antitrust has a record of detecting few illegal uh, transactions. So those are the limits of the law. But blockchain, of course, also has limits. Um, namely, the technology cannot achieve decentralization as a process on its own. The rule of code uh, is not preventing all of the forms of artificial concentrations, and for that reason, it needs the rule of law. Uh, and and it, it, it leads us to to the need for cooperation between blockchain and antitrust. Right. So, the blockchain ecosystem is definitely kind of fundamentally a less kind of political and more technical set of approaches to. Uh, solving a lot of these problems. And that doesn't mean that these uh, two camps have to be kind of enemies and fight each other, right? Like sometimes political techniques actually work. Uh, sometimes political techniques are just fundamentally not going to work and you need technical approaches. And sometimes y you're talking about international markets where political techniques uh, just are not feasible in any case. And so often enough, what you actually want is to try to kind of combine the two together. Right, so what are some of the you know, technical approaches uh, that blockchains are you know, bring to the table? Right, I think the really important one is basically this idea that you can create market structures and kind of other forms of structures for cooperation where you have some notion of shared state, but you do that without having a single actor kind of running and managing the shared state. Right, so instead of uh, everyone going through a market that, that's controlled by one actor, you would have everyone going through this uh, kind of collective system that anyone can join. And then at the edges of that system, you have kind of actors of different sizes, some individuals, some corporations, some you know, fairly powerful companies providing uh, a very strong and valuable services. But you know, they're at the edges and users kind of have the freedom to choose and users have the freedom to kind of move between these uh, providers and ideally as much of the network effect as possible is kind of shared by this common open system that's not exclusive toward anyone right now this can be done using either kind of permissioned or consortium systems or using public blockchains and the problem with uh, kind of permission and consortium systems, of course, is that in, in practice, setting up these consortiums is hard, right? It's often very easy to get your first member, easy to get your second member, but then once you start talking to your seventh member, what often happens is that the seventh member comes along and says, you know, hey, wait, isn't this system kind of basically run for the benefit of these kind of six other powerful uh, entities that are already there and that already have kind of all of the say and are fi in figuring out you kind know, of the, the structure and the rules? And so, you know, you often get this uh, kind of inability to scale up to the size that, that you originally hoped to scale. And this is something that I've actually seen happen in a bunch of cases. So the benefit of public chains is that you know, it is a fully open system. Anyone can join it. Um, it's a common misconception that an application on a public chain means that that application has to be kind of fully anarchic, you know, have no points of centralization at any kind. Public blockchains as architecture uh, is uh, definitely has uh, some of those properties, but the the benefit of that architecture is precisely that you can build applications on top of that base layer that have like basically whatever control structures that you want to have. Right? It's uh, kind of like saying you know if you look at the English language, the English language is in many ways kind of anarchic and kind of fairly chaotic in terms of. Kind of how it evolves and how the kind of actual rules that people speak with are, are change, but at the same time, you know, there's a lots of things with varying degrees of governance structure, varying degrees of centralization, varying of patterns of cooperation that use the English language to talk to each other. Right. So public blockchains, I think, can be viewed in a similar way. So for that reason, we are arguing in the paper that public permissionless blockchains are best to achieve that common goal of decentralization, and that antitrust agencies and governments should take that into account. It means uh, creating comfort zones, namely sandboxes and uh, legal safe harbors. In a nutshell, sandboxes are testing grounds for businesses which are supervised by regulatory institutions, and safe harbors are pretty much the same, but they are not limited in time or to certain specific actors. 
These comfort zones are useful when it comes to experimenting technical solutions in exchange for legal and or economic advantages. And there is indeed a lot of questions to be solved when it comes to the technical point of view of blockchains. The reason why we are arguing in the paper that we need those experimentations to be protected by the rule of law. And it is definitely true that right now public blockchains have serious uh, scalability issues. And I think that's what's historically been preventing a lot of the interest in them. But at the same time, you know, we've been seeing a lot of really hard and uh, kind of fast work on layer two scaling solutions that are starting to even exist. For example, on the Ethereum main network, uh, we've been seeing layer one solutions like sharding and kind of evolve. And so I think the landscape of just readiness of uh, public blockchains for even larger scale institutional applications is kind of changing uh, very quickly. So there's still a lot of questions that you have to kind of resolve for any particular application. Like, Blockchain architectures are definitely not suitable for all applications. There's a lot of applications where they just don't make any sense at all. Um, you know, you have to um, think about, you know, not just the rules of the system, but also the rules of the thing that you're building on top of the system. It is joining the network kind of technologically barrier free? Is it legally barrier free? Is there kind of publicly open source software for all of the necessary functions that you want people to be able to do? How resilient is the blockchain? How resilient is the thing that you're building on top of the blockchain? Uh, so there's definitely a lot of questions, but looking at blockchains as a kind of base layer for this designing systems where you know that they're going to have network effects and it's just a matter of figuring out kind of which system the network effect accrues to is something that I think is really worth exploring. In the long term, we very much believe that it's a win-win solution for both the law and the technology and that we need to change our mindset accordingly. On the one hand, of course, policymakers may be tempted to, to always punish all legal practices, even those which result from the tech characteristics themselves rather than the malicious use of the technology. On the other hand, blockchain developers may be naturally tempted to ignore the legal constraints. And we very much believe that this is a mistake, as again, both antitrust and technology here, blockchain, could actually benefit from one another. So uh, that's the idea of the paper. Thanks a lot for watching the video and uh, take care. Bye bye.